Okay, Hebrews, we finish the book. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 16. Please read along with me. Our writer, I believe the Apostle Paul, you'll see more Pauline tonight than at any one study in all of the book of Hebrews. He writes this, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, highlight that word others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. And then listen to this glorious conclusion. May the God of peace, think tranquility. May the God of tranquility, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers, now this is where Paul identifies himself as a pastor. Listen to this. Brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written you only a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. Father, once again, as we finish a book tonight, as a church body, we have read every single word of this glorious epistle together. We've left out nothing. We've skipped nothing. We had the privilege of going through yet another entire book as a church family. Lord, I pray that the blessings contained in this book are blessings that we have grabbed hold of. I pray, O oh God, especially on this night that we finish the book, that we understand the focus of ministry. Last week we talked about how to be consistent in our walk. Tonight we get to talk about the object of our walk. Jesus, help us who are yours to love you more than we've ever loved you before. If there's even one here tonight, as your birthday approaches, Jesus, we'd love to wrap them up and give them to you as a gift, even one who doesn't know you if they're not yet born again. My prayer is that this would be the night they would surrender their lives, their hearts to you. We're grateful for this letter. We're grateful for the work you've done throughout our considerable amount of time here. And now, Lord, in advance by faith, we're grateful for the work that's going to take place even now. We pray these things that your name would be glorified. Amen. When Gail Irwin was here the other night, he's got a consistent theme, his book, The Jesus Style. I think we still got some Jesus Style books back there in English and Spanish, and they're free. And it, it's a book that you can read and pass along, and it will change others. But the consistent theme throughout the book is others. Jesus was, according to Gail Irwin, and I agree, the most others-centered person who's ever walked the face of the earth. Jesus was a man, but he was here only for others. Though he knew everything that was going to happen to him, his focus was on others. Though there would be people who would try to kill him, his focus was on others. Even his betrayer had opportunity after opportunity to repent because Jesus loved him. When the rich young ruler came up to Jesus, we're told because he loved him, Jesus told him the truth. Jesus' ministry was completely others centered. And tonight, the Apostle Paul, again, I believe to be the author of Hebrews, 
is going to return to that theme of looking out instead of looking in. Looking up to have the gifts, to be equipped to minister to others instead of yours. I don't know if any of you have seen them, but years ago, about three years ago, uh, Gail, when he was here, he brought boxes and boxes of bumper stickers that said one word, others. And a whole bunch of us here have those on our cars. It's just a constant reminder that this isn't about you. Now, Jesus' ministry is about you. You say, well, if I'm other-centered, then who's going to take care of me? He's got you. But our ministry on his behalf is outside of ourselves and is to be extended to others. This is a study that Paul says focuses on your ministry to others and imagine, if you will, the smile of God when Jesus looks out over the edge of time and space and says, they get it. They get it. Calvary Chapel of San Antonio, it's not about you. It's about others. And in the process of ministering to others, God provides everything that we need. Everything that we need. Let's get into the final study in Hebrews. He writes, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, highlight that please, sacrifices, God is pleased. Our New Testament tells us, find out what pleases the Lord. Well, in verse 16, this is what pleases God. Do not forget to do good. Do not grow weary in doing good good things, but do not forget to do good. When we get up in the morning, everything that we do ought to have that as its focus. I'm going to do something good for somebody else. I'm going to tell somebody else about Jesus. I'm going to look for somebody who looks like they're in pain, and I'm going to be there to pray for them. To do that, we've got to step outside of ourselves. That's the idea of a sacrifice here. And when we do that, when we share with others, For such sacrifices, we're told God is pleased. Now again, for the last time in this book, I'm going to remind you that this is a group of really beleaguered Christians. Now for as much as 20 to 30 years, they've been persecuted. They've had their backs uh, beaten. Their family, friends have turned on them simply because they became Christians. And over a period of a long time now, they're tired of the the persecution. They're just ready to give up. And you remember this book is filled with warnings. And now Paul says, you know how to survive when things are really hard? Think about others. One of the things that will be a consistent truth in your life is that the more time you spend thinking about you, the more miserable you're going to be. The more time you spend thinking about others and what Jesus can do through you for them, well, the better off you're going to be. It is a sacrifice. Remember, David saying, I will not give that to the Lord, which costs nothing, to do good, to share with others, and make sacrifices pleases God. It's not doing what you want in order to do something that will benefit somebody else, doing exactly what God wants. Now, this is the practical outworking of love. It is the truly spirit-filled life. I always think at this juncture in the book of Hebrews of our two New Testament characters, Mary and Martha, because the spirit-filled life is really a perfect combination of the two sisters. Mary, of course, the one always sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha, the one who's always working, trying to get things ready. She wants everything to be perfect. She's like a lot of you. And yet, right in the middle is the perfect example of a spirit-filled life. Martha, you'll remember, was busy and she was sort of grumbling and grumbling and grumbling about, why don't you make my sister help me, Lord? And Jesus looked at her and said, your sister Mary has found the better part. And Martha was gently and lovingly rebuked by Jesus. Now, her heart was in the right place, at least at the beginning. She knew that things needed to get done. 
and she was willing to do them. When you're willing to be used by the Lord, he's always going to provide opportunities. What we have to do is have the service ethic of Martha with the heart of Mary. And Mary, the only place we get her heart is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Three times in her New Testament, we see Mary of Bethany mentioned, and all three times she's at the feet of Jesus. Because of that, she has greater insight than even Jesus' 12 followers. They're still kind of in denial as he goes to the cross. Not Mary. Because she's at the feet of the Lord, there's always spiritual insight. She was hanging on every word that Jesus had for her. Martha, a devoted woman, a woman who loved Jesus, at the same time could have those times when she would slip and she would start thinking about, well, nobody's helping me. Jesus said, Martha, I can see that you're troubled by many things, but I'll paraphrase here. I'm not going to correct Mary because she's found the better part. Now, Martha's the way we should all be willing and available. You ever wonder why it is that so many churches cannot find people to serve? I'm not talking about volunteers. Every church has volunteers. I'm talking about real servants. The difference is important. A volunteer serves when he or she has time, when it's convenient, when it's not going to move them, when there's no sacrifice involved. A servant is the man or the woman who says, Lord, here I am, I'm available. What about me and what about today? And that heart will always be rewarded by the Lord. I say on the radio program all the time to people about church, when you go to church, don't look for a church that meets your needs. Go find a church where you can meet the needs of others. Don't come to church and say, well, Lord, I'm looking for answers. I want a blessing. Those things will happen. But here's what you do. You say, Jesus... I'm looking for some divine appointments today. I'm looking for some people who look like they're hurting. I'm looking for some people who who I don't know. I'm looking for people that I can pray with or pray for. I'm looking for someone that I can encourage. Well, the only way you're going to be that servant is to sit at the feet of Jesus. There's never enough enough Marthas. We just have to be sure that we have Mary's heart, always found at the feet of Jesus. When we understand that, then the sacrifice that we make doesn't seem like a sacrifice at all. Martha, to her credit, accepted Jesus' rebuke. I'm sure for a moment it stung. I'm sure there was the It's not fair, I'm doing all the work. But the next time we see her in Scripture, she's busy serving again, but she's serving with a heart of woman who's also been at the feet of Jesus. If you want full joy in your life, then make the sacrifice to serve others. It's the only way that the power of God's Spirit is going to flow from you. The power of God's Spirit is always ready to come upon you. But in order for that power to flow through you, your focus has to be on others. The next, verse 17, obey your leaders. Those are the others. And submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Now, I could do a lot here that's self-serving, and I don't have to do that This is the the easiest church to pastor in the whole world. So these are lessons you can teach others. I think most of you have already learned these lessons. Please never forget that your spiritual leaders, the pastors, the elders in this church, are really accountable to the Lord for the ministry that we do. But for us, then that ministry is going to be judged by our focus on others. I am afraid that too many pastors think it's all about them. We get to stand up and we get to talk and you have to listen to us and you need to do what we say and then when you don't get it, we get frustrated. But the whole point of what we do is for you, for other people. And that work is important because people get saved. We do that 
because people's lives change. But you see, what I do is not about me, it's about you. What you do also has to be about others. It's painful in our church culture to see so many pastors, leaders in churches take advantage of their positions, to see some get wealthy on the backs of their flocks. Those men and women, unfortunately, will stand before God and give account of their ministry. God has, and this is one of the great honors of my life, knowing Jesus and being his is first, being her husband is next, being your pastor is next. And I'm going to give an account because he's entrusted you to me. It means that I'm accountable for what I teach. I'm accountable to make sure that I live a life consistent with what I teach. It means that I need to rightly divide the word of God. Here are the things. I'm going to ask you to turn ahead to Acts chapter 20 or to turn backwards to Acts chapter 20. And I'm just going to share a little bit about this emotional scene to give you an idea of what my ministry is focused on with you being the others that are involved. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. This is Paul's emotional farewell to the Ephesian elders. He's going to Jerusalem. You talk about sacrifice. He's going to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be at best imprisoned and thrown in jail. At worst, he's going to be killed. Everywhere he stops, everywhere he goes, people warn him. Prophets, the dramatic prophet Agabus and others If you go, you're going to suffer. If you go, you're going to be beaten. And he tells them, I know these things. You're breaking my heart. I'm willing to die for the sake of the gospel. And then at the end, as he's saying goodbye, really trying to tear himself away from the Ephesian elders, he says this in verse 25. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. I can hear the tears and the boo-hoos in the background. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. The first thing I'm accountable to others, to you for, is to make sure that I rightly divide the word, but that I give you the whole counsel of God. Don't leave anything out. I don't preach stories about the Word of God. I I don't skip over the hard stuff because, well, I want people to feel good about themselves when they come to church and I want them to come back. If my ministry is really other-centered, then I've got to be sure that I'm teaching you the whole counsel of God. It is why we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible. There are times when it is a delight and a joy to teach a particular portion of Scripture. It's just, oh God, I get to teach this week and everybody loves it. But there's other times when I think, well, nobody's going to really walk out of church saying, boy, pastor was bringing it today. (laughs) But it's all his word. And the Apostle Paul, I remember the church at Ephesus, is the church that Jesus is going to write to in about 30 years from the incident in the book of Acts and tell him you're doing some good things. You paid attention to what I told you to do but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. And Paul says, I'm innocent of the blood. Of all men, I've done my job, now it's on you. Calvary Chapel, I'm accountable to God to make sure that there's nothing left out. That I'm as direct as God wants me to be. I'm responsible to God to be able to say, if you don't accept it, that's not on me. I tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me, Jesus. And Paul says that's the first responsibility of an others-centered spiritual leader.
Not only that, in verse 28 he says, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherd, shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Here's why. Because I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Verse 31 says, So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. If my ministry is other-centered, then we've got to constantly be on watch against the wolves that will come in and pick at this weak sheep or the sick sheep or those who are going through difficult times. Again, remember that in our Hebrew study, these are men and women who are just tired of the persecution. And it's easy for wolves to come in. And our job is to keep watch. Our job is to mark people at times. Our job is to warn you to be good stewards of God's word on your own, to watch your lives and doctrine closely, which is what Paul will write to Timothy, just as Paul is about to be done and killed for his faith. Remember that for three years, he said, I know and I am more aware of it than you are. There are some things that I will say that I can see some of you mouthing the words. But I'm never going to stop warning you of those things. I'm never going to stop trying to exhort you. And the reason is because it's my job. Now, if all I wanted was to feel good about what I do, I could come up with other stuff. But it's my job. The next part of my job is verse 32. It's the easiest part. Now, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What that means is simply this. I do my job. God does his job. And whether or not you do yours then is between you and God. Talked about serving with Mary and Martha. Do you know in most churches, getting people to serve is like pulling teeth without Novocaine. Not so here. Still, we have needs that go unmet. Service needs. There are still people who come to church and that's all they do. Just come and they go and they say hi and eat lunch and see you next week. Until and unless you're serving the church that God has given you as a church home, then you're missing out and it's not on me, it's on you. And what I do then is I simply say, Lord, I commit them to the grace of God. Pastors shed a lot of tears over their churches, the people in them. It really hurts to see people who are hurting and never more than when those hurts are self-inflicted. It hurts when people like at the end of our study tonight will be given the opportunity to come and pray and some do but most don't. It hurts when I know the Holy Spirit is working and speaking to people's hearts and convicting them. It hurts when they stay angered to their seats just waiting to be dismissed. One of my jobs, because it's an other-centered ministry, is to cry for you and to pray for you continually. And I do that. Verse 33 says, I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. And this is the only record that we have of Jesus saying this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, what's really important about that is that we need to be hard workers. Not just at our job, 
But we need to be hard workers here. You know, the people that say, well, you know, Sunday's my only day off and, you know, I'll go to church, but I just don't have more time to spend. God says you're missing out. I'm not here to fill the seats so that I feel good. I'm not concerned about how many people come to Calvary Chapel. I'm certainly not getting rich from your offerings. My job is to love you, to teach you, to watch out for you, and to help you understand that being a Christian is hard work. Not grow weary in well doing. Paul talks about his work being night and day. I pray that I've been a faithful example of hard work. I do my job, an example that others can follow. That's my responsibility and my others-centered ministry. Your responsibility is now to deal with God. It's work. It's a sacrifice. I said this earlier, but David crying out, I will not give that to the Lord which costs nothing. Too often we, 21st century Christians, are trying to give God what we have left over if it doesn't really cost us anything. That Christian is missing out. God says work hard, do it for him, and just see what he will do for you. Speaking of leaders, he tells you, or again, your ministry, other-centered, mine, other-centered, obey them so that the work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. I have no complaints. This is the best group of Christians on the face of the earth, and I am completely convinced of that. Then he says this in verse 18. He says, pray for us. Pray here is in the present imperative tense. In other words, what Paul is doing is begging for prayer. Pray for us. I covet your prayers. The leadership at this church covets your prayers. The staff that works here covets your prayers. And Paul's not too proud to beg. I always think of the old temptation song, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. Paul is begging for prayer. Please don't stop praying. And then he says this, We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I hope this doesn't sound self-serving. My conscience is clear. The work that I do here The heart that I do it with, my conscience is clear. But one of the things that convinces me that this letter is Pauline is that this is something that he's already written to other churches. He said, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. My conscience is clear. I can stand before you tonight and tell you that my conscience is clear. I'm not living in sin. Uh, My wife loves me. I love her. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living my life before the Lord uh, as much of an open book as I possibly can. I try by the power of the Spirit to do the best I can to live honorably in a way that pleases God. I want God to be first on my thoughts and on my heart always. And I tell you again, my conscience as clear. But just as Paul wrote to Corinth, That doesn't make me right. That doesn't make me better than any of you. It just means I'm doing my best. I'm going to leave the rest of it up to God. You see, I was earlier said I commit you to the grace of God, the word of grace. Well, I have to commit myself to the word of grace. That's a good word for some of you here tonight. You need to lighten up on you. Don't be harder on you than God is. Don't expect more of you then God does do the best you can and then just leave it in the lap of God. He'll take care of you. My conscience is clear because I've done the best I can for these 24 and a half years. 
Now, I've made some bad decisions. I've even made a few foolish decisions over the years. But I can also tell you that at least up to tonight, those bad decisions or foolish decisions were made with the right heart. And God was able to take them. He was able to sort of Rubik's Cube them around and make them work out. Because God always honors a heart that's right with him. You men especially, because we put so much pressure on ourselves to be right and do right. I want you to understand something. The only thing you have to make sure of is that your heart is right with God. If the rapture of the church happens before I'm done tonight, I'm waiting for a minute. (laughs) Or if my life ends before the rapture of the church, I can really and truly stand before God and say, I did my best. I did my best. I did it with the right heart. And he'll show me how he covered over all my mistakes, all my foolishness. He'll show me all those times when I thought I was perfectly correct in everything that I was doing and sort of we'll have a giggle together. But remember, if your heart is right with God, he will take care of the rest. He also then says in verse 19, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Paul always wanted to visit people that he knew. And in this particular case, he's saying, look, I I don't know how much time I've got left. I want to see you soon, so you pray for me. Paul was a man who wasn't ashamed to ask for prayer about big things, but also about little things like this. I want to come back to you. It doesn't say they wanted him to come, but I want to see you again, so please pray that I may be restored to you soon. And then all of this with our other-centered ministry, look at the payoff as we close our study tonight. Look at the payoff beginning in verse 20. May the God of peace, or tranquility I like better, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. I had the privilege of talking with the man today and, and, and telling him that the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is all we need to know. If we start there and work backwards, then we can make the rest of the Bible make perfect sense. That's our faith builder. There was an empty tomb. There was a man that was killed. He didn't stay dead. We know he's alive. This book has already told us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So what we believe is true. Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, Look at his ministry to you. All you have to be others centered. Then Jesus says, he will equip you with everything good. Not some things good. Not a few things good. But everything good. You might also add the margin of the Bible. Everything that you need. He will equip you with every good. Everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Have you had those moments of, God, I don't know what you want from me. He wants you to be other-centered. He wants you to serve. He wants you to sit at his feet. He wants you to sacrifice time, talent, treasure. And then just sort of wait because he's going to pour out everything that you need. I get frustrated so often with people who, who they know God's calling them to do something, but I can't do that. I'm not equipped to do that. I'm not qualified to do it. God gives you everything that you need. I want every one of you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else tonight, I want you to hear that whatever it is God has called you to do, you have what you need to do it, and you're ready, you're available. Let me change that. You're able. You have to supply the available. But everything that you need. I know why it is. We go to work and we can do our job, but when it comes to something that God wants us to do, go share your faith. Be active in sharing your faith. Oh, you know, I'm not capable of doing that. Yeah, you are. Take that little step of faith and let faith win. More on that in just a moment. 
Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. I like the word refreshment here. This is refreshment. Now, we've been through some pretty tough stuff in Hebrews. But see, the tough stuff refreshes as well. These are things they needed to hear. Paul said to them, do you remember? I ought to be able to treat you like adults now, but, but you're still like on baby food. You're spiritually lazy. Come on, let's get with it. Study to show yourself approved. And he gave example after example of people that they could follow in Hebrews chapter 11. And then he says this, for I've written you only a short letter. If I got a letter in the mail as long as the book of Hebrews, I don't know that I would ever get through it. But from his perspective, these are important things and it's just a short letter. Then he says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Evidently he wrote this from Rome, not in prison. This is not a prison epistle. And then he says this, which is Paul's motto for living, grace be with you all. God's unmerited favor to the infinitely all-deserving. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many times you've failed. Grace be with you all. Now I'm going to close our study in Hebrews by reminding you of three ideas that have been communicated throughout this book. Now I could, I could make a couple of more studies out of these, but but we've been pretty detailed and in-depth. So there's just three things that I want you to take home with you tonight. The first is from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. We already talked about it a moment ago. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Now this isn't, he's able to save completely He's not talking about I'm going to save you. You're already saved. He's talking about in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your persecution, Jesus is pleading your case. Jesus is an everlasting statement of intercession. He is always busy as our high priest. A high priest ministry is to represent the people to God. So Jesus' ministry is other-centered. He will take care of that. All you have to do is utilize the gift of Jesus' intercession on your behalf. I often picture Jesus, and this is just the way my mind works. I often picture Jesus sitting in heaven sort of twiddling his thumbs because nobody will ask him for the things that they need. You know, we're, we're quick to talk about the things that we need. But far too few of us really go to the Lord in prayer about those things. Now we'll do the material things. Lord, I need a new car, I need a new house, we need food, we need this, we need that. But I'm talking about the things we need to minister to others. Lord, if you give me the opportunity, pray for opportunity. Lord, when you give me that opportunity, fill me overflowing with your spirit so that it's all you and not me. Lord, give me a heart willing to serve others. Give me a heart like your heart that thinks about others even before I think about myself. Putting others' needs ahead of my own. You want a key to a rich, rich life in Christ? That's what it is. It's about other people. As you minister the Spirit of God to other people, as you minister the grace of God to other people, All of that comes back at you and on you and then it's through you all over again. Paula, when we go to bed sometimes at night, she'll lay down and she will say, sometimes it just feels better than others. Well, those are the times when grace is spent. But you know that there's a whole new batch of grace waiting for you when your eyes open. All you got to do is ask him. All you got to do is 
ask him. It also means as he protects your ministry for and to others. He will help you when you are tempted. He will help you when you've got the conviction of the Spirit. You know, you're doing this. God wants you to stop this. Just go to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't want to stop it. My flesh doesn't want to stop sinning, but I know you want me to. I need help, and he will help you. But if you don't ask, where are you going to get the help? It means he will help you when you're feeling down, when you're depressed, when you're going through times of discouragement. It means that Jesus, your Jesus, is available every minute of every day. Please do not neglect his role as your advocate in heaven. The second thing I want you to remember is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It was the next to the last warning in the book. It says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day in capital is the day of judgment approaching. We're running out of time. I've talked about that endlessly in the Gospel of Luke and in our Isaiah studies on Wednesday night. The day of the Lord is coming. Now, he's going to come for us first. That means we have a limited time to serve. We need to be men and women who do not neglect the assembling of the saints together. It's good for us, but what's best for us is that this is the place where we can minister to others. We can use the gifts that God has given us. But we can't do it if we're not here. Don't misunderstand me here, but every Christian ought to be at church at least two services every Sunday. And then you need to get to church when church is open other times as well because that's when you serve. That's when the opportunity, you know, Paula, poor Paula, she's been poor Paula from before I was saved. (laughs) Poor Paula, she sits right there every service. This is the woman who prayed. Remember, she was praying to Jesus, her intercessor. Jesus, I just want a husband who will go to church with me. Be careful what you ask for. (laughs) She's here in that chair Three services on Sunday. She said, other pastor's wife say, well, why do you go to all three services? I just go to one service. And our answer is really simple. And, and this isn't something I make Paula do. I couldn't make her do anything. But this is what God has put in her heart because her ministry is other-centered. Her response is, well, if I go to first service, the people in third service don't know I was there and I can't be with them and I can't minister to them nor can they minister to me. So she's there. She's there on Wednesday. She's there on Friday. She's there three times on Sunday. Remember she asked, she just wanted to be able to go to church with me. But she's here on Monday for the ladies' ministry. She's here on Tuesdays about half of the month because that's when worship rehearsal is. And yet she's always available to others. That is an others-centered ministry and she loves it. She loves it. To some of you that may sound like torture. Actually, for her to have to listen to the same message three times from me sounds like torture. But she loves it and wouldn't miss it. Don't give up on the church. It's very fashionable these days to give up on church. Well, I like Christ, but I don't like those Christians. This is where we belong. This is where we can give out. And the man or the woman who doesn't like coming or who forsakes coming to church is the man or the woman who is only interested in ministering to self. The third thing I want to remind you of, and I'll close, this is the most important thing of all, is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, I could go on and on and I won't, but 
There's no way to serve God without faith. We come to God by faith. It is a gift from God. It's not something that we have. If you ever think, you know, well, I believe, so I came to Jesus. You didn't believe. He gave you the, the ability to believe. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. You have to believe to be saved. Well, it's also true that to persevere, to be blessed, to be a blessing to others, you have to step out in faith. You've got to do things that don't make sense. You've got to do what he tells you to do instead of what you feel like doing. You've got to be stretched out of your comfort zone. And if you'll do that, your life will be enriched immeasurably. You've got to believe by faith that anyone who seeks him earnestly will be rewarded by God. I'll close with this. We go back to the very first verse. It's a sacrifice. For those of you trying to please yourself, how does that work out for you? I can tell you, based on the Bible, the Word of God, based on my own personal experience, based on what I see over and over and over here at Calvary Chapel, that when you are pouring yourself out to others, the blessings of God come with such power and such frequency. You wonder, how did I get to be so blessed? And Jesus will say, it's because you believed me. You believed me. Stop trying to take the easy way out. Stop trying to do what makes sense. Seek the Lord. Do what he tells you to do and believe that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That's what Hebrews is all about, completing the work that began in power and sort of over the years fizzled out. Tonight as we invite people up here to pray, if over the years, maybe just over the months, your passion for Jesus is sort of fizzling out, Please come tonight, repent, and let Jesus refresh you and restore you. I can tell you firsthand that on this month we celebrate his birthday. There's no greater gift he would like for his birthday than for you to come and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, let's get going together again. Let me love you more than I loved you at the first. Help me love you more every single day than I did the day before. It'll change your life and God will use you to change the lives of others around you. Would you pray with me? Can we have some of the men and women from the pastor's class come forward? Father, as we close our study tonight, we close this book, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the the, the sometimes brutally direct teaching in this book. I want to thank you for the great and glorious promises in this book. I want to thank you most of all that you have chosen Jesus as your ministry to make us the object of your ministry. And now I ask you to help us understand that our ministry has to be others-focused as well. 